Um, before I start with an introduction of our uh, speaker, I just want to point out the, um, the little placards that are on your, uh, on your seat. If it's not your seat, I'm sure it's on your neighbor. You can feel free to grab one of those. It's a QR code on the back. Just scan that and it'll take you right to our website and so you can uh, stay up to date about all of our uh, programs coming up in the near future. Um, and I see a lot of familiar faces, and I see a lot of new faces today, so thank you so much for coming. If you are a guest of one of our members, and you're not yet a, uh, a member, uh, please uh, see me, Joe Yen, or anyone that got the, uh, the little name title. I'm so happy to sign you up. Uh, membership at the World Trade Council is of wonderful value. Um, you get emails on exclusive uh, events that we're doing, um, our newsletter, and just and you stay in this wonderful community of us. So uh, please consider being here. Uh, one more uh, housekeeping item. Please remember to um, put your phones on silent. Uh, we are trying to record this, so uh, any buzzing that's going to interfere um, you know, with the recording. So thank you so much for going ahead and doing that. All right. So, I'm putting my phone on silent, oh, okay, too. <laughs> That's a good example. <laughs> okay, so tonight's event, China's Next Move, this is part of our World in Transition series. And with the COVID pandemic restrictions that are finally uh, almost lifted in China, um, we're facing some of its uh, biggest domestic and foreign policy challenges. This has opened its doors to the world many decades ago. So questions about its intentions towards Taiwan, how it manages its global leadership in the face of Russia's war in Ukraine, and its troubled relationship with the U.S. and the West, and have created many uncertainties. So the big question is, what is China's next move? And today, uh, hopefully they answered that, probably not in its entirety, <laughs> we have Lucy Hornby. She is a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a visiting scholar at Harvard's Fairfax Center for Chinese Studies, where her research focuses on the revival of the Chinese state and the rise of Xi Jinping during the reform era. She lived in China for almost 20 years, working as a journalist for Reuters and Financial Times before returning to the U.S. as a 2020 fellow at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard. She first moved to China in 1995, teaching English in Wuhan, thanks to Princeton in Asia, a program that builds bridges between the U.S. and Asia. Lucy is also a fluent Mandarin speaker and reported from every Chinese province and region on topics ranging from politics to the trade war and environmental pollution. And tonight we have uh, Shoyan Bao, who's going to moderate our discussion after Lucy opens with a few remarks. So thank you very much. And please welcome our guest speaker tonight. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. And um, I want to say how honored I am to be here. Um, you know, I, I feel very strongly as a journalist who covered international affairs um, and who lived overseas um, that our foreign policy is too important to be left up to Washington. Um, and so it's really a privilege to be able to um, come here and speak to you guys. Uh, I've already met some of you, and I know that you bring a wealth of international experience. Um, so uh, please forgive if any of this seems too broad brush, um, but I was told very strictly that I have 20 minutes uh, for my talk. Um, and if I exceed, then this button is gonna suck me up that thing. Uh, so you know, forgive any, any generalities and uh, hope to hear from you guys during the Q&A. And thank you also to Xiaoyin uh, for inviting me um, and to her team for promoting the talk. So I appreciate that. Um, now, China's next move is obviously kind of a large topic. Uh, but I thought that I would start a little bit uh, by going back a little bit and just saying, you know, how did China get to where we're at, um, just as a starter. So, um, just to give an idea, uh, as we said, I first went to China in 1995. I was an English teacher uh, in Wuhan, which nobody had ever heard of until <laughs> January of 2020, when Wuhan infected the world. Um, <laughs> 
But uh, I was in Wuhan back in the day when it was a city of seven million people that nobody had ever heard of. Uh, and this is a picture of my class at the time. Um, they were up and coming, uh, very ambitious people, ready to move up in the world. Uh, but as you can see, their physical conditions were really pretty basic. Um, our classroom was rudimentary. Uh, it was unheated, uh, which was a problem in the winter when it was about 38 degrees and raining constantly. Um, the students lived together in unheated dorm rooms uh, between six and eight in a room. Uh, a few of them had families that owned cars. Uh, most of them, of course, had never been overseas. Uh, for some of them, I was the first foreigner they had ever met. Uh, and, and, but most of all, you know, the physical circumstances of their lives was really uh, basic. And it's hard to see in this picture, but uh, actually the panes of the windows were missing. And so they took chairs and stuffed them into the windows to keep the wind and the rain out of our classroom. Uh, fast forward, and this is the apartment building that I lived in uh, before I left China in the summer of 2019. Um, so, my neighbors were from a similar class of people. They were upwardly mobile, um, they were college grads, uh, but in the intervening 25 years, um, their physical circumstances had changed enormously. They owned cars, they owned multiple apartments usually. Uh, their children uh, were going to college overseas in many cases. Uh, they themselves had traveled to many countries. Um, so it just is an enormous shift in a lifetime uh, that really influences where China sees itself coming from. Um, and uh, also, I think that we should keep in mind when we're talking about, you know, how do we address this new challenge of a country that is now uh, as big and as important as we are on the world stage. Um, now, a little graphic to kind of draw that home as well. Whoops. This uh, is a graphic that was pulled together by a Norwegian um, political scientist named Ruben Matheson. Uh, I'm very grateful to him because I think it shows in a quick look uh, what are the changes that we've seen. So in, as you can see here, the bubble that's the United States in relative GDP, it's declined somewhat relative to the rest of the world, not hugely. Um, but the really big changes have happened elsewhere. So Western Europe, Europe uh, had expanded from 1970 to 95, but then it shrunk back again quite considerably. Uh, Japan, of course, expanded tremendously. Uh, the Soviet Union virtually disappeared, and China took up most of that slack. Um, so, you know, to me, that's again a very telling um, thing that that a lot of the games China has made, uh, we talk about them, but they've been felt in the rest of the world very much. Um, now, another way to visualize this. Oops, uh, which I think is even more telling. Uh, if you recall in the GDP picture, the US bubble and the China bubble weren't that much different. Uh, but in world manufacturing, uh, China's already outsized, right? It, it is much bigger than anything else, including bigger than our manufacturing sector. Um, and so the difference, uh, the Chinese manufacturing sector is much bigger than the Chinese economy. And that difference is what gets exported to the rest of the world. Um, now, for credit where credit is due, I didn't make this graphic either. It came from a financial literacy website called howmuch.net. Uh, um, but I think you know it's a really excellent visualization because when we look at China's next steps, you know, a lot of us think about how China wants a place on the world stage that's commiserate with its size. But it's also very much driven by the fact that it has an industrial sector, a manufacturing sector, that is much bigger than its own market. Um, and they don't have a political willingness to accept a downsizing, right? They looked at what happened to the United States from our peak of manufacturing to now. Uh, they looked at what happened to cities like Pittsburgh, like Boston, uh, Louisville perhaps. They don't want to go through that kind of disruption. So a lot of their positioning on the world is determined by the need to have these markets externally uh, because they're unwilling to trim that capacity domestically. Um, so what does that mean uh, in terms of Western business? Uh, this is a picture of the Chinese president uh, and party general secretary, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, with many of the most powerful CEOs of the world. 
he summoned them all to China. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, I think maybe 2018, um, to very much tell them, look, you know, we want you here, we need you here, and you must be here. Um, it was kind of a mixed message in that way. Um, and I think that, you know, in the past three years, we have, uh, because of COVID, lost a lot of those business connections. Um, the trade tariffs also caused a lot of disruptions. But this spring, I think, is going to be an important moment where people are just chomping at the bit to get back into China, uh, to see how their business lays, uh, to see how the economy has survived there. Um, and I think that we're going to see a real charm offensive on the part of the Chinese to make sure that their economy still looks like the most attractive place to be, both for manufacturing and also for capital investment. Right? Um, they, they have to make it look like the best destination. And part of that is because the way that they have set up their economy, uh, because of this unwillingness to uh, decrease industrial overcapacity, they need that capital to continue flowing in. Uh, it's an important imperative for them. Now, from the point of view of all these gentlemen around Xi Jinping, they need China too, right? Um, if we look again at this chart, the world has put its manufacturing eggs in the China basket. Uh, and so, um, you know, the global business community is still very, very much entrenched in China. Now, they've also had kind of a rude awakening over the past two or three years. Um, the COVID restrictions, uh, the political tightening, uh, the disruptions that have happened uh, both politically, socially, and physically to the supply chains have made a lot of people rethink the degree to which they want to be embedded in China in this way. Um, Japan and Korea went through this thought process about 10 years ago already. And their country, those industry sectors, the Japanese and the Koreans, have already made a very conscious decision to diversify their supply chains so that they are not completely dependent on China. Um, but the Americans and the Western Europeans have found that much harder to do. Uh, and part of the reason is that we have a very different incentive structure for our business executives. You know, the Japanese uh, and Korean, uh, the heads of the chai balls in Korea or the heads of the big Japanese companies, um, they can take a longer view. Uh, the Americans are extraordinarily focused on a short-term profit. Uh, and the other thing is that since the global financial crisis, a lot of our manufacturing sector has been taken over by the financial sector. So the decisions being made are being made to pay down the debt that these companies were taken over with not necessarily in terms of the long-term health of this comp these companies. Um, so that's kind of the um, conundrum that we find ourselves in nowadays. Now, the other conundrum, of course, is the geopolitical one. Uh, so China, you know, they're obviously very eager uh, to take a role in the world that's commensurate with their size. Uh, and I think that, you know, if I was a historian 50 years from now, I think that I would view this week as being the week that the Americans woke up to the fact that we are really a multipolar world again. Um, you know, we're not the sole superpower. I think we've been gradually losing that status probably since the um, global financial crisis, but it's really driven home when all of us are going on to, you know, pick your poison, whether it's Twitter, Fox News, New York Times, Financial Times, my old employer and trying to figure out what's happening at a negotiating table where we aren't at, right? That was not grammatical, but you get my point. Um, but I also think there's a lot of fascination with the idea of a Chinese-Russian alliance, right? Uh, and especially in Washington, that's very much interpreted as a binary Cold War, a binary two-pole world. Um, I don't think that that's a good um, metaphor, actually, personally. I can get into that a bit more. Uh, but first of all, let's talk about what we see, right? So what we see uh, is that we've got two countries who communicate to the public, their own publics, and the external public very much in terms of symbolism, right? So Putin and Xi have met together, I think, something like 40 times, anyway, dozens of times. Um, they talk a lot about their friendship. You know, they give birthday parties to each other, which you know is kind of weird when you're in your 70s, right? <laughs> um, and but at the same time, they don't speak a word of each other's language, right? So this is a friendship that's not driven by personal feeling, but 
by geostrategic considerations and also to a certain degree a shared cultural heritage, right? Um, China used to be very aligned with Russia. Uh, Xi Jinping's father was one of the Chinese leaders that was one of the liaison um, officials to Russia. So there is a sort of psychological or, or cultural orientation there, but there's also you know, very different current circumstances, right? China is a complex manufacturing economy. It's enormous. Russia has turned into basically a resource exporter, specifically an oil exporter, with a very large military presence. Um, you know, so they're, they're very different in many ways. Uh, but anyway, because they communicate in symbolism, I thought I'd talk a little bit about this, this picture and what we're seeing here. Um, so uh, Putin has chosen a room in the Kremlin to meet um, where uh, Stalin and Mao Zedong met back in the early 50s. Uh, so it's a, it's a choice that has a lot of resonance um, for both of them, right? And, and perhaps they're hoping for the rest of the world as well. Uh, but it's also a room that the czars used as kind of a ceremonial uh, coronation room. Um, and one thing about Xi Jinping is that when he goes overseas, he seems to really want people to treat him like a king, <laughs> which is sort of a strange setup, you know, for the head of a communist party, but he is so attracted by all the trappings of royalty. You know, he wanted to ride in a carriage with the queen. He meets all the heads of state, all the royalty of Western Europe. Um, you know, so there's something about him that wants to portray that, those visual trappings of power. And he's projecting it back into uh, China, right? He wants Chinese to see him that way. Uh, but to a certain extent, he's projecting it to us, right? And, and you certainly see Americans responding to those symbols of power. Uh, and of course, he's also projecting this to the rest of the world. So one of the big audiences for this summit was all the countries in the world that are not the US and not Western Europe uh, that might welcome a multipolar world, you know, that welcome a different source of power in the world, uh, welcome different people to come invest, welcome you know, a different way for things to be ordered. So I think that you know, when we look at China and we look at their diplomacy, we should be very clear that that plays pretty well in a lot of the rest of the world. Um, now, another little thing, and this is like journalist nerd, uh, <laughs> but you may notice that Xi Jinping has a little tiny thermos right next to him, in addition to the wine, wine glass he's holding up. And it's something that we foreign journalists have noticed over his reign, the 10 years of his reign. When he goes somewhere, his bodyguards bring his own water. Uh, and, you know, I mean, if I was best friends with the guy at the table, I think I'd accept the water they gave me. Um, <laughs> certainly, I accept Shaheen's offer of an old-fashioned with some Kentucky bourbon last night. Um, so, you know, I, th I think this kind of drives home, like, this idea of uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, right? Uh, he's taking his own water in with him to these meetings, despite being, quote-unquote, best friends. Um, now, what do China and Russia see in each other? Uh, again, I think in DC, we tend to, or people in DC tend to take on that paradigm of the Cold War, but there's some real structural issues going on here uh, that work in favor of these two countries at least keeping each other on side. Uh, one is they've got a really big border. They've got each other's back, literally, physically, geographically. Um, another is, uh, and, and that speaks to the ge geostrategy as well, uh, that a lot of the ties that we see um, bearing fruit now between China and Russia were actually formed between the Chinese military and the Russian military in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the Russian military found a customer for all that so Soviet weaponry and technology in the Chinese military. Um, I think those were ties that perhaps the United States overlooked at the time. You know, we were very fixated we, me, I was teaching English in Wuhan, but you know, we, broadly speaking, were fixated on securing the Russian nuclear arsenal. Um, but there was a huge traffic that went out in, in terms of military technology and equipment. And, and that seems to be the basis that now Xi Jinping is building on politically as he orients China towards Russia. Economically, socially, most Chinese are not oriented towards Russia at all. If anything, they're far more oriented towards the United States. Um, the lifestyle they've embraced, the concerns they have about the environment, about uh, the world they live in, um, the consumer model, education, even speaking English, you know, 
socially in a society, China is still quite oriented towards the US, but the political apparatus has been oriented towards Russia. Now structurally, a couple other things I'm gonna point out quickly. Uh, one is that China is very worried about American sanctions and the way that we can wield that in the world. Uh, and so from the readout, I was quite interested in the press conference uh, that she and Putin gave. Um, Putin mentioned that they were very open to using Chinese renminbi or yuan uh, as a settlement currency in Russia and uh, in areas around the world where Russia does business. Um, now that's a really key thing for China because they're very eager to have that currency sphere of influence that would inoculate or insulate them from American um, sanctions if that should come. Uh, the final thing is keep in mind that huge uh, circle that we had for manufacturing capacity. China's manufacturing capacity desperately needs markets. Um, now, some of it we happily buy in the United States. Uh, probably this, well, probably everything, <laughs> in fact, that's technically around this room. Um, but there's also overcapacity in terms of um, construction, in terms of engineering, in terms of labor crews. Um, you know, and that's not finding as welcome a market in Western Europe or in the US, but I think China sees a huge potential market for that along the periphery of, of the former Soviet Union. Um, so, you know, China sees these areas as, as a place to offload its overcapacity. Um, so it's an economic play by them, as well as a geopolitical and strategic one. Um, but it's one that's not necessarily driven by pure profit economics. It's not economics the way we understand it. It's economics in the way a planned economy bureaucrat looks at the fact that he's got too much capacity. What do you do with it? You send it off to somebody else. Um, now, uh, as a parting thought though, the Chinese um, and the Russians don't seem to be 100% eye to eye, despite all these structural similarities. Um, you know, China made a big deal about coming to the summit uh, with a peace plan in hand for Ukraine. Uh, now, of course, in the U.S., the dialogue has all been about are the Chinese uh, aiding and abetting the Russians in their invasion of Ukraine? How does that compare to our increasing willingness to su supply weapons to this conflict? Uh, but, and, and in Washington, certainly, they didn't take seriously the idea of a Chinese peace plan. I think the Chinese, though, did take it very seriously. Uh, they are hoping that in the rest of the world, in the Middle East, Africa, uh, Latin America, it will be taken seriously. And I think that Putin must have taken it seriously, too, because he didn't sign it, right? Mm. It's pretty clear from his remarks after the meeting that although Xi Jinping talked his ear off <laughs> about it, Putin couldn't agree to it. Whatever it was, we don't know the details, he couldn't agree. Um, and so that in and of itself tells me that it was more than a piece of paper. Um, and in response, the Chinese then refused to sign a deal that the, that the Russians wanted very much, uh, which is this gas pipeline project to bring gas from the Yamal Peninsula uh, on the Arctic Ocean into China. Multi-billion dollar gas project. Uh, and they didn't sign it, although they had some hopes that they would. Uh, so this is not a monolithic alliance here. Right, and, and it's very much one that's driven by both countries' perceived interests. And, and that leaves room, I think, for us not to treat it as a burgeoning Cold War, but instead to treat it as a multipolar world that we can navigate. So parting words on that front, and then I think um, I'm not gonna be sucked up by that little <laughs> thing. Um, oh. And that is just a parting thought that I think really in the world today, the wild card is the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we tend to think of the wild card being Putin, uh, being China, what's it gonna do? But in many ways, it's us, right? Because on this column, you know, these guys, they've gotten a little older and a little fatter, but they're the same guys, right? Yeah. On this column, you know, I don't know who I put, if I put a fourth picture here, I don't know who's gonna be in that picture. On this side, I know who's going to be in there, right? Um, and you know, as we all know, we have divisive domestic politics. We don't have a consensus in terms of what our role should be uh, in a new world in which it is multipolar, where we are not the sole superpower. Um, 
you know, there's various ideas out there, right? Some people definitely want to make Fortress America, drop the drawbridge, you know, don't let anybody in, don't let anybody out, don't talk to anybody. You know, I think that would be a huge mistake. Uh, in, a, in a multipolar world, what we need are the connections, the knowledge, the sharing of information, things that are symbolized, uh, you know, by you guys here at the World Affairs Council. Um, but also the paradigm of a new Cold War I think doesn't totally work either, right? And the main reason it doesn't work is because of this huge overcapacity that China has, um, because of the fact that we're so economically intertwined, uh, but also because of the fact that the relative losers to that, for the most part, have not been us, right? They have been a lot of other countries that have seen their manufacturing sectors completely depleted uh, by corporations' decisions to move all those eggs to the China basket. Uh, and that leaves an opening for us, right? It leaves room for us to do not only real diplomacy, by which I mean showing up day in, day out, not occasionally a presidential tour, um, but it also leaves a lot of room for, you know, if America chooses to diversify uh, its manufacturing base again, to recreate those ec economic ties, uh, there's room for us to do that. Um, so with that thought, uh, I will leave you and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Ah, works. All right, well, um, I thank you, Lucy. <laughs> I hope uh, that gave everybody, if I could try to move this and look at you at the same time. Um, a kind of a broad stroke, that. right? Move it that way, I think. I don't think it, it move the chair. You. Move the chair. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can move my chair. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't get one thing to move, no, 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 no. Okay, there Muhammad we go. Muhammad can go to the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How's that? Can you hear him in the back? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, thank you, Lucy, for that really nice kind of setup for us. And um, one of the things that when we when we started talking about this in the very beginning, I thought Lucy, because you know she's got this extremely uh, kind of a personal, professional experience living in China, reporting, really seeing everything up uh, close and personal. And But one of the challenges had been, where do we go? Where, what topic do we actually cover when we're talking <laughs> about China? And, she was like, you know, there's so many things that we can we can talk about. So uh, I thought that was a really nice setup because it really kind of addresses the then and then where we are right now. Um, so it gives us an opportunity to kind of dip, go a little bit deeper on some of the other topics that we we might have. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions that might be just kind of like what we are some of the bigger questions that had, may not have been addressed. But I'm going to leave the rest of you to really kind of fill in the gaps that of things that you really want to hear. So um, I'm looking forward to your uh, Q and A. So I think one of the things that we, I want to pull on a little bit more is about you know this this is a great visual, which is you know China as a peacemaker, peacekeeper. Um, you know, and, and the question is, do you feel that China's ambition of being such, has that really, is that something that has changed uh, really very much in the, in the recent years? Um, has it always seen itself eventually taking that kind of a role? Um, and, and how effective do you think China's going to be as a peacemaker? So I think China's always seen itself as a world power. Right, and it was a world, you know, it was the dominant power in Asia for centuries, right? Um, but for much of the 20th century, it wasn't a world power, although it saw itself that way. Um, but it just didn't have the clout, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I think now you're back in a situation where you have the economic clout, uh, the economy supports a military that is untested but getting bigger and getting more technically able. Um, so. I think China doesn't necessarily see, you know, it's not like Switzerland, right? It doesn't see itself as a peacekeeper, but it sees itself as a world player, right? And so whether you're a world player in terms of dominating others or whether you're a world player in terms of brokering, um, either way, it fits into this vision that's been there for a long time, but also now the capability to actually impact world events. Right. Well, one, one thing that we have all been hearing quite a bit lately, 
can't get away from is about TikTok. So are all of the security concerns around that. So I guess you know the, the question is, should we be worried about TikTok um, any more than we are with Facebook or any of the other social media platforms that we are we are all on? Um, what are your thoughts? Is it a real security risk for us uh, versus you know all of the security problems that we've we've talked about with Facebook in the last couple of years? Okay. So I should preface this by saying it's very clear that Xiaoyin has teenage children, uh, because every time I emailed her and said, you know, this topic's so broad, I don't know what to say. She's like, TikTok. <laughs> um, you know, I have mixed feelings, and here are my mixed feelings. I think. In the United States, uh, a lot of us have, uh, without much thought about it, handed over a lot of information to all kinds of uh, internet or you know apps or websites. You know, it's pretty shocking if you want to buy something online. You know, it seems like they want all your identity, and you're like, why? Um, I, we have built our corporate technology sector in such a way that it is designed to capture our data. Um, our houses, if you have Siri or Alexa, your house is listening to you at all times. Um, you know, I just got a car and I had to have a big fight with the car dealership because I'm like, no, I don't want the tracker on the car. I don't want my car tracking me and I don't want my phone tied into my car. And they thought I was crazy. Um, so which you know, comes from being a reporter in China and being very sensitive to the fact that you're being tracked all the time. Um, but you know, I think, broadly speaking, we have been very naive in how we treat this technology and how much information we give to this technology, uh, and also the way the technology is designed. You know, it's capturing information from us that, frankly, it doesn't need to capture. Right? These things could be designed to capture less. They could be designed to forget or erase information, but they're not. So within that context, now we have people raising the alarm about TikTok, right? Because it ultimately, although it was actually developed in the US, right? But it has a Chinese owner at the end of the day. Um, I feel like it's kind of good to raise awareness to people to the degree that this technology enables surveillance. I think it's a huge mistake if you treat TikTok as the only problem because it's like, oh, owned by the foreigners, you know, owned by the Chinese. Um, whereas really the problem is the way that we have designed our tech sector. Um, and I know a lot of journalists who are in China, you know, kind of when we reported on the Chinese tech sector, we kind of did so with an eye towards this is also raising the alarm, you know, about the tech sector generally and how it's been designed and how it could be abused, right? Hasn't necessarily been yet, but definitely could be. Um, so I myself am more worried about that design overall mm -hmm. than I am particularly concerned that you know the Chinese government is spying on a teenager in New Jersey or in Kentucky. Um, but you know there is that potential there, but frankly there's that potential there in everything we're using. Um, and I think people need to be a whole lot more aware uh, of the way we've had that designed. Yeah. And uh, TikTok's Chinese company is ByteDance, and, and uh, they are very, very tech savvy with all these different social media platforms. Have you seen any kind of real pushback from the Chinese population about this kind of privacy concerns? So it's interesting. In China, um, the, the, you know, the Chinese are as addicted to their phones as we are, um, and they have as much personal information, or if not more, living on it. Uh, and there has been an enormous problem with fraud in China, and, and people getting defrauded um, because uh, of how much of their life is online. And so it's kind of interesting, because on the one hand, the Chinese government reserves to itself the right to surveil its citizens, right? There's no pretense about it, right? They, that's a right that the government has in their opinion. But on the other hand, they've actually gone to a lot of effort to try to educate people about the ways in which their information is being sold online. Mm -hmm. so, so it's kind of this schizophrenic you know, effort. It's like, well, you know, we, the government, absolutely can be watching you, big brother, 
but we don't want you to be cheated and lose your life savings uh, or have your data somehow sucked up online. Uh, so, so they've got a kind of barbell, like double binary poll there. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, the US, we're still kind of in the middle where for the most part, I think we're still pretty naive about how our data is being used. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like, as the government, you can trust us but don't trust anybody else who's not yeah. the government. Right, that's the Chinese That's the message. Chinese, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <That's, laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, uh, one thing that we, uh, and you, there could be a lot of follow-up questions about that, but I wanted to turn on to something um, that we haven't talked about, but I think kind of precipitated this uh, before was really the question of Taiwan at the beginning of, um, you know, when when we, you know, the whole Ukraine war started, even before then. Um, and there was that concern before the, before Xi Jinping was, you know, kind of elected to his, this current term. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, you know, wanted to get your thoughts on what do you think the, the short term, medium term, long term game really the plan is for t Taiwan? How, how do you see chi China's really looking at the island? So, I mean, again, I think Taiwan is kind of a bit like this slide, right? Um, China has been consistent for 70 years that they intend to control this island. The question is, can they, right? And for 70 years, they have not been able to. Um, now, that could change. And, you know, what you've seen as China gains in power is they've tried to do a kind of slow strangulation, uh, slowly moving in ways that gradually uh, restrict Taiwan's way of movement. Um, Taiwan has, of course, been very aware of this. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, they tried investing in China to kind of create economic ties there. They're now divesting and trying to invest elsewhere uh, to diversify their industrial base. Um, the U.S. tends to be a little more, to view this problem a little more as a matter of strict military. Um, and, you know, certainly the military scenarios, you can play them out. Uh, most ways that you play them out, uh, China would win. Um, and that's simply because Taiwan is so close and China is so big that if you did a blitz kind of invasion, you would have it. And then once you had it, it would be hard to dislodge. Um, so I think really it's not a military question at the end of the day, right? The US has been focused on deterrence, uh, deterring that kind of thing. Um, but it's really a balance of power issue, right? It's kind of like the Chinese game of, or the Asian game of Go, which in the US is kind of Othello, right? Where you try to make the, make the stones and once you've surrounded an area, then, then you can empty out that area. Um, you know, there's a kind of a game of Go going on around Taiwan uh, and I think at the point that the balance of power has shifted decisively in China's favor, I think China is likely to make a move at that point, but they're not going to do it until they are sure the balance of power is decisively in their favor, because uh, they don't want to screw it up. You know, if mm -hmm. they need to do it fast and conclusively. Um, so I, I uh, debated whether to include Taiwan in this uh, presentation, but I decided that at the end of the day, it really is a question of the larger geopolitical uh, maneuvering and negotiations uh, between us, China, other poles in the world, and, and of course Taiwan itself, which has been very adroitly uh, trying to play a very poor hand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a balance of power thing, I think, at the end of the day. Do you, uh, do you feel like the, the Chinese you know, people is behind something, you know, if it comes to that. Or China's not obviously at that point that you t said, you know, it's, it, it thinks that it, it can make that. Yeah, I've never met a single Chinese person who did not believe that Taiwan was 100% part of China and ought to be brought back as soon as possible. Um, so, yeah, there's a tremendous national consensus that this is what should happen. Now, of course, that consensus is also in place, you know, without any cost being attached to it, right? Uh, which is another reason that I think that if China were to try to invade Taiwan, they would want to do it very fast and have it over very quickly. Um, and you know, a lot of people have been viewing uh, the brewing or the, the year-long now conflict in Ukraine mm -hmm. as a kind of testing ground, you know, to sort of see how that might work. 
Um, you can also view the Chinese-Russian alliance as being very motivated uh, by the desire to have someone at your back. Um, and China and Russia have been very um, obviously doing things like maritime drills in the Asian oceans uh, to sort of signal that intent. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's, it's been an exercise that, you know, there, there's a national consensus that this is a priority, um, but it's a consensus without cost. And so, again, I think China wants to wait until they see the balance of power being tipped so definitively um, that there will be very few consequences. So let's talk a little bit more about perceptions because, you know, uh, again, back to this, this picture is, uh, makes me think about, you know, we have the leadership that's been, that's been changing in the U.S. and, and uh, fairly static in uh, Russia and China. But I'm curious, you know, I've seen, I think most of us have seen in the last couple of years, just the general public perception about the country, for example, about China, much more hawkish than it has been before, right? Um, for all kinds of reasons, all the things that we talked about. You've been in China for 20 some years. What, what, what's your sense? Has there been a change, overall change about Chinese people, you know, what their perception about, say, the, the U.S. and the West? Yes, I think there has been. Um, I think that, you know, with my students, it was like China, my Chinese students in 1995, um, in our room with rain coming in the windows, you know, the U.S. was sort of, it was the shining city on the hill, right? It was viewed as a, a model to follow, both in terms of what you could have in terms of creature comforts, uh, but also in terms of you know, Chinese perceptions about our American system. Uh, and there's a lot that people find attractive about it, and that is still the case. Um, however, you know, once you reach a lifestyle that's equivalent to our lifestyle, um, once you've been able to travel around the world, uh, once you have a situation also where you know, we've aired a lot of dirty laundry um, you know, in public, which we do as a democracy. Um, but, you know, a lot of Chinese now, they feel like, well, you know, we're, we're equal. We, we, there's not so much, there are things to admire, there are things to dislike, but, but we're equal. It's, we don't have to look up to you. Mm -hmm. we're, we're equal to you. And so we would like to be treated like we're equal. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a, a strong drive for that in the Chinese public. And so they very much welcome you know, any circumstances where they see China being treated or the Chinese leaders uh, being treated with respect mm -hmm. um, and faith internationally. Uh, so, so I think there's a strong, I don't think there's a dislike of the US, it's just that, you know, we're equal. Yeah, more so cautious. <laughs> we'll take the good and we'll leave the bad and, you know, don't tell me what to do, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions, so I'll just leave one question, which is really, you know, there's so many t things that we, we have talked about but haven't talked about. Uh, is there any one thing that really kind of worries you between the U.S. and, and China, whether it's a particular conflict or any kind of concern that you think um, can really quickly unravel any other areas of possible cooperation between the U.S. and China? Um, yeah, I, I worry that I think in D.C. in particular, um, you know, we've been kind of hijacked by the China threat narrative. Um, you know, as you saw by these slides, uh, China's formidable, right? I'm not denying that, right? It's a formidable economy. It has a large, although untested, military. It's a formidable geographic player. I, all that is true. But I don't think that we should uh, put ourselves in the position where we are shooting ourselves in the foot, right? We, where we are, um, you know, recently we had a, a Chinese visitor come to visit us and he got really badly treated at the airport. Uh, you know, that's not the way to create soft power, honestly. It's a way for people to be like, screw you, we don't need you, right? Um, I think that, you know, uh, for journalists, um, there have been a lot of journalists, American journalists kicked out of China, um, but, but there's also been a decision uh, in Washington, you know, not to welcome Chinese journalists here. Uh, and, you know, honestly, I think that's completely short-sighted. 
because I can sit in Beijing and I know exactly what's happening in America, right? Like everything hangs out, right? We, all you have to do is follow our debates, which are very open. Um, but I can't sit in America and know what's happening in China, right? So, you know, I think willfully blinding ourselves because we are so hung up on the China threat is a big mistake. And I also think it's a really big mistake for us to concentrate our diplomacy as being only anti-China. Um, because if we're in a multipolar world, then, then we need to attract the other poles, right? And so we need to have those economic ties, personal ties, diplomatic ties. Um, I think we're gonna have to probably uh, go to a more real politic approach to diplomacy and a less kind of, you know, I don't like you, so I'm not talking to you <laughs> kind of approach. Um, you know, we're gonna have to be flexible, we're gonna have to be present, and we're gonna have to be attractive. Um, and, you know, I, I think that gatherings like this hopefully help that, um, but I think that, you know, too much buy into the China threat narrative ends up being counterproductive for us. Um, and, and doesn't hurt China that much, frankly. Um, so, you know, that, that would be my thought. Thank you. All right, well, I think we can open it for questions. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And then I think we have, uh, Shanti has the uh, mic, so. So we've got every, all the questions on this side. <laughs> we'll state one, and then we have one over here, too. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So what the related to what you were talking about, um, and one of them is the, uh, the, the, the narrative of don't shoot yourself in the foot, and I'm seeing a lot of, kind of half truths and misinformation coming out of the US media and out of Washington about the China threat. And I'm just wondering, like, where is that coming from when it's coming out of the US media? And I'll talk to friends and say, we're decoupling, we're not doing business with China anymore. And I'll say, well, 2022 is the largest bilateral US China trade. Record in mm -hmm. history. So people don't even know, really? No way. So they think there's this decline, this decoupling. And, and so are the journalists just not doing their diligence or are they making a lot of assumptions and their opinions? Like, where's all this misinformation and half truths coming from? Okay. So in Chinese, there's a saying which is, your brain is where your butt is. Um, <laughs> This is true. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that uh, one of the disadvantages of COVID uh, was that people ended up talking to analysts and people who they knew already, uh, but spending less time maybe traveling, right? Um, the American, almost the entire American press corps got kicked out of China, right? Not entirely, but almost entirely. Uh, and so you have you know, a concentration of journalists in capitals, which are dominated by sort of the geostrategic guys. Um, and you have far fewer journalists, uh, first of all, overseas. You know, our, our overall, our press corps overseas has diminished incredibly. Um, but you also have far fewer journalists around the country, right? They, they really, the Wall Street Journal still has bureaus around the country. Um, but but the, the degree to which our national media reflects our um, national industrial base, particularly in the Midwest, has shrunk tremendously. Um, so, you know, I think that we have lost a lot of perspective and a lot of voices. Um, I hope that with uh, the travel restrictions lightening up, um, that people will be able to get out there and see more. Um, but, but I do think that there's a, an echo chamber effect, mm -hmm. and it's not helped by the concentration of, of the American press corps in capitals, right? Brussels, Washington, London. Um, so, so I do think, you know, I think people do their best to seek a variety of views and to have those views be accurate. Um, but you need people on the ground, right, for that to work. A follow-up question. Uh, this is related to Taiwan, and it sounds like you were saying the balance of power 
when China has the balance of power, they might go after Taiwan? And is that a military balance of power, you're talking about? So I, you know, obviously haven't sat in the Chinese strategy sessions. I think that if there were a way for them to absorb Taiwan that was not military, they'd prefer it. Uh, but they have never precluded a military takeover, right? So, you know, my guess is they have preferred option number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then, you know, they've got the one that invo involves a physical invasion. Um, but I don't know. Um, I do know that their current, you know, their, their strategy of kind of trying to cut off Taiwan's diplomatic ties elsewhere, mm -hmm. trying to uh, subsume the Taiwanese economy to the degree possible into the Chinese economy, uh, to orient Taiwan more towards China, uh, to influence Taiwanese media, Taiwanese politicians. Um, all of those are sort of non-kinetic options it also have a lot less downside if they take longer or if you know a certain initiative doesn't work right away. Um, so I think that they would prefer not to have a military invasion, but I'm sure that there are military invasions in the plans. And, and related to that, it's so. <laughs> Let's give someone else a chance. Yeah. <laughs> actually, my question was to set up was actually to set up my real question. I was just oh. asking you, is it military? Then I think you went on for a long question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming to Louisville. Uh, this is an interesting topic for a lot of us. My question is internal and external. Internal, how powerful are the Han in economic and military terms within China, since you have Tibetans and Uyghurs and others? Secondly, external, and that is when Japan gains more capital, when Taiwan gained more cap capital, they went and moved manufacturing to other parts of the world. And now, when do you think China will start doing the same? Because they have the capital. Uh, when will they go into South America? Or the places where they can get cheaper labor. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, very quickly, so the question about the Han, uh, the Han Chinese are the dominant ethnic group in China, um, but they are concentrated in the lowlands um, and not in the enormous frontiers uh, that China has. Um, the economic power of the Han and the political power of the Han is nearly absolute. So absolute. nearly absolute. There is there is very little uh, economic power in the hands of the what they call the minority ethnicities. Um, one exception being the Korean ethnicities that live along the Korean border uh, have a little more autonomy and a little more economic power. Uh, the Tibetans and the Uyghurs they've actually done a lot to decrease their economic power uh, because they viewed it as a threat to the central dominance of those areas. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you've read about the, the uh, internment camps, uh, the re-education camps where many Uyghurs were um, unwillingly enrolled. Uh, that, to a large extent, they started with the elite. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a, a dismantling of local economic power um, in favor of the center. Uh, and what was the question? Oh, Chinese investing overseas. So. A lot of the, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? Um, a lot of the Hong Kong business people who invested into China's original growth have now switched their investments to low-income countries, uh, particularly Bangladesh um, and Southeast Asia. So, so there's been a shift of that kind of investment. Um, the Chinese state-owned enterprises have been encouraged uh, to go out and invest. Uh, for the most part, not 100%, but for the most part, those investments have been uh, concentrated in places with resources that can be brought back to, to feed the Chinese manufacturing machine. So Africa, Australia, um, South America. And um, for Chinese businesses, uh, you've also had Chinese private businesses who've tried to invest overseas. Um, many of them have done very well in Africa. 
uh, because there's a niche there, right? Um, and you know, you've, there's a lot of really good documentaries actually of a sort of cultural navigation that happens when Chinese try to open factories in Africa. Um, there's also been some Chinese investment in the United States, uh, including manufacturing investment in the auto sector. Uh, and there again, there was a really good uh, documentary called, what was it called, China Factory? Yeah. Or was it American Factory? I don't remember. Anyway, I don't know what you're talking about. There, you can find <laughs> it. It was either China Factory or American Factory, and it was about a Chinese-owned yeah. factory in Ohio. I think it was Ohio. And basically the negotiations, particularly with the labor union, uh, mm -hmm. that proceeded from that. So, um, you know, there's been some really interesting case studies. I think there's some real navigation and negotiation that happens. Um, but uh, especially, the docu for some reason, the documentary media is by far the best uh, for exploring how that's worked out. And I think that's because there are real people involved uh, mm -hmm. who are navigating these different laws, different cultures, different systems. Oh. Hi, uh, Martin Brooks, East Campus International. We have staff that are working on the edges of China, uh, one in uh, South Korea, and this person's interested in the uh, relationship of China to North Korea mm -hmm. and how that, that fits in, the entryway into uh, North Korea from China, so that relationship's important. I'd like to hear your perspective on that. Another staff is working with the Uyghur people, and I'm just wondering if there's any uh, your suggestion that it, would the, the Uyghur people seem to be uh, being shifted to other parts of the country as far as a, a labor force goes, or I've heard that. I just would like your perspective on the Uyghurs and North Korea. Yeah, so North Korea is a really interesting topic. Um, you know, I think the Chinese would like the North Koreans to be a satellite state. Uh, the North Koreans have proven quite spectacularly uncooperative on that front. Um, at the same time, they only trade basically with one country, which is China. So, you know, it's a very weird relationship. Um, but if you talk to any Chinese government official or corporate official about North Korea, what you get is 100% frustration. Um, so, you know, I think in Washington, we tend to view the two countries as being in lockstep from China, it's not at all that perspective. Um, from the Korean point of view, I personally have never been to North Korea. Uh, my, my husband actually went on a tour of North Korea and it was fascinating for him. Uh, but, you know, they are a country which has one card to play uh, because of the way they've chosen to set up their political system. The one card is nuclear. And so that's the card they play every single time. Um, and, but they're very proud. They don't want to be a satellite of China. They don't want to be invaded by the US, which they think is imminent. Um, and so you, know how you have this dynamic that I think on the ground is very, very different from how it appears uh, from here, right? Where we tend to think of North Korea being a China problem. Um, in terms of the Uyghurs, uh, those who weren't following, uh, starting about five years ago now, in the fall of 2017, uh, there was this enormous crackdown in Xinjiang, uh, and specifically on the ethnically distinct people who are the Uyghurs. They are mostly Muslim. They speak a language that's much closer to Turkish uh, than to Chinese. Uh, they um, traditionally are trading people. Uh, with a very strong business um, orientation. Uh, but they've also been uh, very much left out in the economic development of China. And there was the shift between 2014 and 2017. Um, there were uh, some episodes of attacks, you know, some of which looked like they might have been terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. some of which were clearly not terrorist attacks, but China treat, chose to treat it that way. And so China began seeing uh, Xinjiang as being a security threat. And so the solution was, well, we're going to force these people to be like us. So they really dismantled um, the Uyghur elite. They jailed people who were, you know, had done nothing other than translate Chinese novels into the Uyghur language. Um, they jailed anybody who appeared to be religious. Uh, and that involved, you know, if you have a beard on. 
Um, they set up a system of schools where children as young as two and three years old were put in boarding schools so that they would learn Chinese and not Uyghur. Uh, they uh, founded these re-education camps. Um, there were even Han Chinese that got sucked into the re-education camps uh, because they hadn't given the right answer. Uh, and so it was, they basically reinvented the gulag. Um, it was a terrible thing. Uh, and, you know, I think foreign journalists were very active in trying to expose what was going on, as were Uyghurs who were living and working overseas and who suddenly found they couldn't contact their parents, their sisters, their kids. Uh, people had just disappeared. Um, now, over time, those camps have morphed, and now the, they have turned into essentially uh, factory working camps. Uh, and part of that, uh, to address the other gentleman's question, you know, China doesn't want to lose its manufacturing base, right? We go back to that problem of them having a huge manufacturing base. They don't want to lose it to lower income places elsewhere. And so the idea is to kind of recolonize their own hinterland uh, and push people into working, you know, into these factories. Um, Chinese business owners have not been super excited about this plan, uh, but they also have huge incentives to cooperate. Uh, and um, it's justified internally as being, we're solving the problem of poverty, that these people are poor, and so we are going to make them not be poor by giving them jobs or forcing them into jobs and also forcing them to assimilate. Uh, because their language and culture is part of what makes them backward. Um, it's, it's, it, it was, I think, a really upsetting and shocking thing. For the, most of us who are journalists in China have a lot of affection for the country. Uh, and so to see a gulag be recreated like that was a very disturbing thing. Um, but that's what's going on. Um, they seem to have backed off. The most terrible stage of it seems to have passed. But it's still you know, a really very, very repressive situation that's going on. So we're going to take two maybe two questions at the most one okay. over here and then one on this side if there are any okay this lady okay. in white has had her hand uh, up for a while ah uh, right <laughs> okay <laughs> quick answers no i'm just joking hello i'm my name is luke you mentioned just now your uh affection towards china and you spent 20 years there i'm guessing that you so, what is something that is uniquely part of Chinese culture that, that, that you've missed since uh, moving back to the United States? Uh, well, I do miss the food. Uh, I can't say that uh, American um, Chinese food is quite the same. Uh, but most of all, what I miss is that, you know, for the most part, on an on a individual level, when you were reporting around China, uh, we were very welcomed. Uh, you know, people were extraordinarily willing to share their opinions, to share their lives, to invite you into their homes, to receive you in their towns. Um, they, they wanted to engage. Um, and, you know, as a journalist, that's really welcome, right? You, you want to one of the reasons you become a journalist is you're curious about the world, you want to meet more people. Um, and you know, if you rock up in a pretty small Chinese town, you get a really warm welcome, for the most part. I mean, there's some big exceptions too. Uh, but you know, for me, what I miss was the variety, the dynamism, um, the interest in finding out what was going on, but also very, very much you know, the idea that people were willing to talk to you, I mean, to an ex a surprising extent, okay? Not everybody, of course, but uh, for the most part, you know, they, they were conscious that something very special had happened to China within their lifetimes. Uh, they were conscious that they had a lot of problems. Um, and, you know, for the most part, they were interested in being a part of this global conversation that was represented by the fact that a journalist had just shown up at their door like we had dropped from the moon, you know? Um, and, and I enjoyed that, but I also appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is very interesting. I wonder if you could comment, I've been thinking about the long-term strategic shift of power between the United States and China. And 
The United States is so focused on a more military, diplomatic relationship with everybody. And China has a long-term, more introspective planning that they've done over time, both within their country of slowly bringing it up to the point where now people have a much higher standard of living and an international perspective of things going on, but also their investments in other countries across the world in infrastructure, and how their strength seems to be gaining by these long-term plans all over the world that are economic and social and not just military um, strength. So I'm wondering, in the long term, do you see that shift in power significantly? Uh, I think China's presence throughout the world is what has shifted things, right? Um, because there are ties that China has to every single one of the other 100 and, what are we at, 186 countries in this world? Um, you know, they have partially deliberately, but not entirely deliberately. You know, from outside, it looks like everything was planned. From inside, it looks like nothing is planned, right? So this sort of idea of China as omniscient, um, I think is a false one. Uh, you know, it's kind of like in the Middle East, they think that everything that goes wrong is because the U.S. did it. Um, but we didn't necessarily, right? So, you know, from, from outside, it looks like a plan. It looks omniscient. From inside, it looks like a response to momentum, basically, right? The momentum of having an economy or a manufacturing sector that's bigger than your own economy. Uh, the momentum of you know, being willing to go to places and work, you know, legitimately quite hard for a very small profit, right, which an American company would never even consider. Um, also, the, the sort of political imperative momentum of, you know, trying to make connections with every country and then committing to economic deals that may actually not be profitable at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they, they engage for sure economically as well as diplomatically and politically, not all of those engagements are successes. Uh, and in fact, a lot of them are not successes, right? A lot of them have not been economically particularly viable. Uh, so, you know, the world is, is littered with poorly thought out projects, right? Um, and I, I think that there's, you know, you've certainly seen in Africa, there's been a souring as well, you know, because suddenly you got a lot of debt, but you have a bridge that doesn't quite work or you have, you know, the road that went to the president's hometown, but nowhere else. Um, you know, so there's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, but I think you are correct that they have been present in a lot of places uh, where we, we haven't been, frankly. Yeah. China has about as many older people as the United States has people. That is true. <laughs> and I'd like to hear your take on the impact of the shift of demographics and the 41 problem on China's economic and geostrategic future. Uh, so the 421 problem, for those who don't know, is the idea that you have a family structure with four grandparents, two parents, and one child. Um, you know, first of all, Many Chinese families now, first of all, you have the right to have two, right? And many have either have two or chose deliberately not to have two. Um, so that has shifted considerably from, say, 25 years ago, where you were forced to have only one. And, and many people didn't like that at all. Um, I, I think that the, the issue with China, um, so, so yes, you do have an aging population. Uh, but you also have a population where um, the, the older section of the population is disproportionately located in the countryside and disproportionately poor, right? And that's because of the rapidity of the development, um, the rapidity in which people have moved to cities, gained apartments, cars, and all that, but you know, their mother may still be in the village. Uh, she may not want to live the, leave the village or 
Chinese laws may prevent her from leaving the village, right? Because China is extremely restricted on, restrictive in terms of its internal migration. Um, so they, they do not allow you to settle in the cities um, to the degree that many families wish they could, right? So what you have is you have a poor, older, increasingly infirm rural population, right? And a younger, more dynamic urban population. And um, so obviously this is a big problem for Chinese as individuals, right? They feel very strongly that they have an obligation to their parents, uh, especially the, the poorest quartile of Chinese. You know, up till now they've met that obligation by leaving, right? By going to the city, making as much money as they could, sending back remittances. But you know, those of you who know who have elderly relatives, there comes a point where money isn't enough, right? Where you need people to be there to take care of them. And you know, some of these villages are really quite shocking, right? There are very decrepit old people and nobody else um, who are kind of inching their way around. Uh, so nutrition, malnourishment, injury, uh, all these things become a real problem. Um, on the other hand, you know, a lot of these people, you know, that cohort of people I don't want to sound heartless here, but they're going to die out, right? And so the, the modern family structure that has shifted in the past 40 years is much more of an urban family structure, right? And so for that cohort of people, you know, China is thinking very hard about things like pensions, you know, old age homes and all that. So it, it's kind of a funny dynamic, right? For anybody below a certain age, then they have the same problem with elder care that we do. But for a certain quadrant of the population, you have this problem of the elderly being essentially uncared for in the countryside. And, and that's a huge, um, it's a huge moral and social issue, but less of an economic issue because of the way they've chosen to structure things, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Well, I know there's a lot of questions, so, uh, but w that's all we've got mm -hmm. for tonight. So uh, if you will just join me, thanks to uh, Lucy for really, really insightful uh, conversation today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're very excited. I know that she's working on some uh, big projects. So in the future, if she's finished and she's able to share with us, love to have her come back oh, uh, for more conversation. <laughs> so thank you all very much for joining us to, tonight, this evening. And uh, we do have, uh, for those of you who signed up for dinner over at Bucks, um, it, please feel free to head over uh, and everybody else. We hope you're gonna join us next month. We have one more program left. We've had several really back-to-back -back programs, but I, I think you will find that they're all very timely. Um, our next program is going to be April 12th. It's going to be about Haiti, Haiti on the Brink, and that is going to uh, feature the former U.S. envoy to Haiti, uh, Ambassador Daniel Foote, uh, also uh, moderated by Ambassador Pamela Bridgewater, who was the former um, ambassador to Jamaica. And so that conversation should be very enlightening. If you recall, uh, Ambassador Foote had resigned after a couple, really less than a year of um, his time into, in Haiti because of a lot of the, the issues that we were having with migration, et cetera. So uh, I hope you will keep your emails uh, open. And when you see that, just make sure to register as soon as you can, because I think we're going to have quite a bit of a turnout for that. That is going to be our last program for some time for this uh, speaker series. So don't miss that. And uh, thank you very much. If you are not a member, I really encourage you to think about joining us as a member. We have Rahel in the back who is our me uh, membership and development manager, who is happy to talk to you more about that. But membership really allows you to take advantage of all of our programs um, in a very easy way. So please consider that. It's a very easy way to support the World Affairs Council. Thank you very much. Good night. Should I declip? Yes, let's declip.